I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. We all have our view of heaven. It's out there in the distance, someday in the future. But the truth is, our view of heaven is kind of blurry. It's often focused more on us than on God. What if your view of heaven didn't match what scripture teaches? If what you expect is different than what you experience, you might hate heaven. I don't know about you, but I hate waiting. I hate it. I hate to be slowed down. Uh, if you stop too long at a stop sign, I will get restless as the driver behind you. If the light turns green and your car stays stopped, I will be the person honking behind you. I just hate waiting. I want to, my really, really bad habits is if you and I are talking and there's a pause in a conversation while you're trying to think of a word, I'll try to finish your thought for you. I just hate Waiting, And it doesn't matter if I'm a car rider line at school or if it's a checkout line at the store. I, I hate it. I'll, I'll go from line to line, hopping from line to line, hoping to find a faster line, but I'll probably still wait longer. I just hate it. Now, I, I know, I know that patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit's work on our lives. I do know that. So if God is going to do everything he wants to do in me, you're going to see patience in my life. I, I know that's what I'm supposed to want. I just want to admit to you, I hate waiting. In fact, I hate waiting so much that one time when I was at a younger, I was a younger minister at another church and a group of elders prayed for me and they prayed for me to have patience and I stopped the prayer. I'm like, can we have a time out on this prayer? Like I interrupted the holy moment and I called the elder by name and I'm like, hey, Bill, uh, please don't pray for that. Can we like, can you like take that back? I don't, is it, is it biblical to unpray some stuff? Like I'm not bragging. I'm just confessing. I hate it. I hate waiting. What about you? Do you like waiting? When was the last time you had to wait for something? I want, go back to that feeling that you had. When was the last time that you had to, to just really wait for something and you couldn't force it for yourself? See, we all wait for stuff all the time. We wait for our spouses. We wait for parents or we wait, our kids wait. We wait on our kids. Students wait for their teachers to put their grades in power schools. Bosses wait for employees. And no matter how different we are, we have this in common. We all have to wait. We wait for different things. Some of us wait for food or traffic lights or repairmen or roller coasters or a doctor's diagnosis. But we wait. When was the last time you had to, to wait for something? One of the things that I think that we collectively wait for or look forward to is, is heaven. Especially when you've had a bad day or a bad month or a bad year. Something difficult or heartbreaking happens and we begin to turn our attention or turn our focus towards heaven. We, begin, we, we focus on getting to heaven. And we think, oh, I can't wait to heaven. I, I can't wait till we go there because there's, there's no, no more cancer. No more bills, no more frustration, no more sin. We can't, we can't, I get to see my lost loved ones. We, we look around in our real life experience and we wonder, God, when are you going to fix all of this? 
Like, when are you going to set all of this right? And if you've ever felt that way, the people that, that we read about in the Bible could raise their hands and say, me too. In fact, in this letter uh, we call Hebrews, uh, in the middle of the letter, they write about our struggles. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's a great faith chapter. And in the chapter, it gives us a list of people who waited by faith. They trusted God and waited on God on, in faith. They anchored their souls to eternity. They were homesick for what God could do and would do someday. And the writer of Hebrews lists all of these past faithful people as servants of God and how they waited. And then he drops this disturbing line. He says, all of these people were still living by faith when they, what? Died. They waited, they trusted God, and they were waiting on God to show up until their dying day. And then he continues, he says, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And I read that, I think, that is depressing. Why is that in the Bible? One of the reasons they can have confidence is they just looked back on history of what God had done. The promises that God had answered, the prophecy that he did fulfill in fact, at this point in history, all of the prophecies of God have been fulfilled but one, his, the return, his, his return, his promise to set everything right. And so they, they waited. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them at a, from a distance, admitting that they were what? Foreigners and strangers on this earth. They, they got to this place where they believe this world is not our home. You were just strangers and foreigners and aliens and sojourners and pilgrims in this world. What if we could get there? What if we could just walk around and admit, well, you know what? This world is really not our home. They, they chose heaven over earth. And it wasn't because of what they read in the book. No, they were eyewitnesses. These Jesus followers saw the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, and they saw how God had moved in the past, and it just gave them confidence that he would move and could move in the future. That if God could beat death, then that gave them the courage to wake up every day and choose heaven over earth. Choose heaven over earth. In fact, one of the reasons we've been doing this series is I I really believe that too many Christians are choosing their idea of heaven over their idea of hell. Nobody wants to go to hell. But not enough Jesus followers are choosing heaven over earth. But what if we were different? What if, as a church, we started choosing heaven over earth in our everyday life? What if we made decisions in this life in view of the next life, choosing heaven over earth? And there's a lot of reasons we don't do that, but I think one of them is because we have this disconnect in in our culture, right? Uh, We have this disconnect in our view of heaven. Are, are, we've been out of focus about what, what we're actually anticipating. So we get our information about heaven from the latest song or the newest movie, the deepest desires, and we assume whatever we really, really want, that's what heaven's going to be like. And if that's our approach to God, then I hate to be the one to break it to you, but you just might hate heaven. If what you expect is different than what you experience, right, you, you might hate heaven. Because one of the disconnects we have about heaven is, is some believe that heaven is like this out there spiritual kind of realm with no human culture, like clouds and angels and harps. But, but in Hebrews and in Revelation, it tells us that heaven is not like this spiritual deal. It's a city. And cities have buildings and art and music and science and technology. Our culture will continue on the new heaven and the new earth. But it's a big but. It will be perfect. In fact, in Genesis, before sin entered the world, God gave humans the responsibility to establish human culture. And he created us and gifted us with this unique gifting. And in 2 Timothy, Paul tells us that if we endure, we will also reign with him. That we get to reign with God. Meaning we'll be establishing heaven and this new heaven and this new earth with God. So if you think about heaven and you think fat little baby cherub angels strumming harps on clouds, you're going to hate heaven. Because that's not going to be like, that's not what it's going to be like. In fact, one of my Facebook friends, none of you, but one of my Facebook friends said, someone's grandma passed away. It's like, I just gained a guardian angel. My grandma just turned into a guardian angel. And if that's what you think about when you think about heaven, you're going to hate heaven. Because scripture actually teaches that grandma isn't your guardian angel. And for her, and this should be good news, heaven for her will be better than that. 
It'll be better than that. So, so we don't need to turn into spirit cartoon versions of ourselves. No, we will put on our heavenly bodies and we will not be spirits without bodies. Not only that, the scripture teaches that humans and angels are actually two completely different beings. And 1 Corinthians 6 says, do you know that we will judge angels? Those Jesus followers will be higher than the angels. We'll be ruling and reigning with our king. And if the idea of that bothers you, then you'll hate heaven. In fact, anytime we worship, anytime we gather together, anytime time we do something as a church, anytime maybe we think about heaven and we put our preference over God's praise, we put our preference over God's glory, you're probably just going to hate heaven because just the name of the Lord Almighty is power. The name of God brings power. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He stands before time and he stands outside of time. He's the creator and sustainer of all things. His voice commands life into existence. He hangs galaxies. He can hold the whole ocean in the palm of his hand. He is miraculous, immeasurable, immovable, unstoppable. He's beyond description. His name is above every other name. He reigns supreme every day. He is glorious and he will reign victorious. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and his glory stretches across the universe See, our God conquers all of our enemies and delivers all of his people. He brings hope and light to every living person. And he has established a kingdom that will last forever. So if in our mind, we are the king of heaven, if in our mind, heaven's about our preference, you're going to hate heaven because you're not the king. He is the king of heaven. So where did you get your information about heaven? And the scripture teaches, uh, describes heaven with imagery designed to emphasize the beauty and comfort. And that's good news to me. Beauty and comfort. A place of perfect circumstances. No more curse, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death, no more tears, no more fear, no more sin or sinners. A place of glorious beauty, a place of intimate fellowship with God, a place of eternal joy. Could you just imagine having joy forever, that lasts forever? a place with perfect friendships, a place of learning and growth, and a place of meaningful work. And so if you want to be a hermit, if you love being alone, and if you never want to work again, and you want to just stop learning anything new, you might hate heaven. Because God says there will be knowledge and friendships and progress and work being done in heaven. And heaven will be anything but boring, but for now, we wait. For now, we're left to just focus on getting to heaven. And as Christians, we, we really do believe that God will set everything right in the end. And if it's not right, it's not the end. So we wait. We wait for one day. Can you see the one day where there'll be no more death or suffering, no more funeral homes, no more cancer, no more missing kids, no more addiction, no more racism or hatred, no more killing or worry or depression or anxiety? I can't wait for heaven. I started this series by asking you, what do you think about when you think about heaven? And if you don't remember anything else, here's what you need to know. Whatever you can imagine about heaven, it's, heaven is better. It's better than your wildest dreams. It's better than your craziest thoughts. Heaven is better than any song you could ever create, any movie you could ever watch, better than any experience you could have on this earth. Whatever you can imagine, heaven is better. But until then, we wait. We focus on getting to heaven. And I just hate waiting. How about you? If you've ever had that feeling, Paul could say, me too. Like, you're not alone. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this, I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. So he's gonna, what he's going to say next, he's going to say, I say this with humility. I say this reluctantly. He tells us this. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Now, scholars believe that he was describing, what actually happened in Acts chapter 14, where it says this, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. They won, uh, won the crowds over to their side and they threw stones at Paul. That's the way they executed people in his time. So they're trying to kill him. They threw stones at him until they thought he was dead. A lot of scholars believe he was dead, so they dragged him outside of the city. So some scholars believe that, that when he died there, that's when he was caught up to the third heaven. But then Paul says this, whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside of my body. So he says, was this an out-of-body experience? Was this an after-death experience? Was I really there? It ah, doesn't matter. 
But what does matter, what I do know, is I was caught up to paradise. And that's a loaded word. We talked about that last week. You want to go back and listen to that. But paradise is good. I was caught up to paradise and I heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. So Paul says, heaven's going to be so amazing I can't even put it to words. I, you're going to try to understand what it would be like, but it's so perfect. I, you won't be able to understand it. And I just can't wait to go back. Now, Paul kicks off this whole talk by, about heaven by saying what he said at the beginning, I was caught up to the third heaven. And people have used that line, Christians have used that line to motivate and manipulate people into thinking, oh, well, there's levels of heaven. So, like, you're probably a one, and I'm probably a two because I'm better. And Paul, he's probably a three, right? And we're Jesus followers. We don't just make up stuff. We use scripture to define scripture. So what Paul meant by the third heaven, we can find context in Scripture. When we actually open up and read our Bible, we'll discover that the first heaven refers to the atmosphere and the birds. Hosea, Deuteronomy, Judges, Daniel tell us that. The second heaven is the area of the stars and the planets, Genesis, Psalms, Jeremiah, and Isaiah tell us that. The third heaven is the dwelling place of God. Matthew, Luke, Revelation, 1 Kings, and Deuteronomy, they share with us that. And so when we think of levels of heaven, first level of heaven, the atmosphere, second level of heaven, and then heaven, one, two, three. So when Paul's caught up to the third heaven, this wasn't about levels of heaven based on his actions. Now, Paul had some kind of otherworldly experience that made him excited about heaven. He left the pain of this earth, and he was with God. And I, I believe that that experience made him write what he writes to the Philippian church. So if you have your Bible or mobile device, you'll want to turn to Philippians chapter 1. It's where Paul is in a prison cell, and he's writing to these Jesus followers, he's, followers, he's literally in chains for Jesus, and he writes this in the middle of verse 20. Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by, by life or by death. So Paul is so confident about what was to come that he just couldn't wait for heaven. That Christ would be exalted by, if I live or if I die. I'm going to have unshakable confidence in what's to come. And you might be saying, well, Josh, of course he does. That's Paul, Right? He's Paul. Of course, he's looking forward to heaven. He's been to the third heaven. He, he, you know he's going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But you also need to know that Paul's confidence wasn't placed in his works because he was also known to murder Christians. I mean, how confident could he be? Let me ask it this way. If you went later on this night, this evening, and wiped out a church of Christians, right, of Jesus' followers with your machine gun, and a few years later you became one, how confident would you be? When you come to meeting your judge, your maker, the holy God of heaven and earth, how confident would you actually be? And so Paul's confidence wasn't linked on what he did, but what Jesus had done. That's amazing grace. And that's why he can say what he says next for me, to live is Christ and to die. <laughs> so he's going to say, if I live, I live for Christ. If I live, I follow Jesus. If I live, I will live like Jesus is my king. But if I die, and what's scarier than death? Nothing is scarier than death without Jesus. But Paul says for me to live is Christ and to die is, what's that word? Gain. To die. If I die, it will actually be better for me. Do you believe that? If I die, it'll actually be better. Then he makes this transition that a lot of Jesus' followers miss. He says, if I am living, uh, if I go, am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. In other words, if I'm not dead, God's not done with me. If I'm not dead, God's got work for me to do. If I'm not dead, I better get to work. Why did he say that? Well, I believe he said that because he remembered what Jesus taught his followers. Do you remember the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to pray? He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, on earth, on earth, as it is in heaven. You see, we focus on getting to heaven. So we sit around and wait for heaven. We sit around and learn about heaven and sing about heaven. We wait for one day. It's going to be so good. But Jesus focuses on what? Bringing heaven to earth. Bringing that, this is so much different than how we picture it. Now, 
I did a whole message on this the second week of our kingdom series. There's a link to it in your notes. You can go back and check that out later on. But the reality is, is that we have this disconnect. The reason we wait for heaven is because we think of heaven like this, two separate spaces. We think of like God's space over here and our space over here. So we think of heaven as like one day. But until then, we just have to wait for the restoration of all things and wait for the perfection of all things. We think that these are two separate spaces. But what's really interesting, and we miss this in the Bible, is that these are not necessarily separate spaces. That when Scripture speaks of heaven and earth, think different dimensions that can overlap. And we talked about going to heaven uh, because we, we think of eternal life as something that's in our future. Heaven is something that's in our future. But when we read Scripture, actually when Jesus defines eternal life, he says it's about knowing God and living for God in this life. Eternal life starts now. In fact, in Scripture, there's this idea that heaven and earth were completely overlapped in the beginning. That in the Garden of Eden, where everything is perfect, heaven and earth are completely overlapping. And then the description of the Garden of Eden, that's what that's all about. A place where God and humanity are dwell together perfectly. No separation between humans and God. They walk with God and talk with God and partner with God. And last week we talked about how free will interrupted that. And that moment that we chose to put ourself and our preference above God, sin entered the world and hell invaded earth. That's what we talked about last week. And so what scripture teaches is hell isn't just someday in the future either. Hell, there's hell on earth right now. Right now, humans unleashing hell on each other. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, in James 3, he talks about the power of the tongue and how he, the, the human tongue has the power to bless and praise God, but on the same time, the human tongue has the ability to gossip about people, tear down people, uh, talk bad about their character, speak poorly of others. And we've, and we've all witnessed this. We've all heard of a person who's taken their own life because of what was said about them not what they did. And Jesus says when humans do that with their tongues, the tongues are lit on fire by by hell itself. It says the tongue, also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by what? Hell. And so James teaches that hell isn't just something out there in the future. Hell is not just one day. There is actually hell on earth. And even if you struggle with the concept of God, if you live long enough, you'll come to a moment where you will witness hell on earth. It'll be an abuse, a trauma, a hopelessness. For me, I remember walking outside the hospital where a grandfather had just backed over his grandson and his own son is trying to kill him in the parking lot. At the moment, I had to tell two little boys that their dad wasn't coming home. The moment I went to a home of someone's final moments of cancer, knowing that they were who they were, but seeing what cancer had done to them, hell on earth. And so we focus, I can't wait for heaven. I can't wait for one day, but Jesus' focus was about bringing heaven to earth. It was getting the hell out of earth. In fact, John says this, so the word, Jesus, became human and made his home or his dwelling uh, pitched his tent among us. This work can be translated dwelling. It can also be translated tabernacle. So Jesus is the tabernacle of God. He's claiming right here is that he's the temple of God. He represents God in a bod dwelling with us. And in this place is where heaven and earth overlaps. And what Je- what's interesting about Jesus is he's not staying in this clean, safe little space. That when we read scripture, he's running out all over here, hanging out with sinners healing people of their sickness and disease and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating these little pockets of heaven all over earth where heaven is invading earth. And what happens is Jesus is healing people in the middle of sin, in the middle of their hell on earth. He's giving them hope, hope to the hopeless. And he's comforting them and he's loving the unlovable and he's casting out these dark powers. And see, we focus on getting to heaven, but his, Jesus focuses on bringing heaven to earth. And Jesus says, the people I love are going to hell. The people I care about are going through hell. 
Jesus loves you so much and hates hell so much that he actually allows hell to overpower him on the cross and destroy him on the cross. That's what happened on the cross that day. In fact, Jesus is proof that good people go to hell. Because the sinless, perfect Lamb of God took hell for us, went through hell because of us. And so no matter what you're going through, it could be cancer or grief, a loss, a loneliness, a pain. God is so in love with you that he will not let hell, the the hell that you're going through, have the last word in your life story. Now, I know that when we think about heaven, we think about waiting, we think about one day, we think about God's space and separate, this, this is how a separate space. We can't wait for heaven. We can't wait for one day. But Jesus' focus was about bringing heaven to earth. We made this about waiting. We made this about just sit and wait to someday. Let's just learn a lot about heaven. We made this about just wait for God to show up. But God says to the Jesus follower, this isn't about waiting. This is about getting hell out of earth. So where there's abuse, get the hell out of here. Where there's hunger in your scope of influence, get hell out of here. Where there's anger around you, get remove that hell from your life. Where there's gossip, get hell out of here. Where there's addiction, get the hell out of here. And here's the crazy thing. Your non-Christian neighbor wants the very same thing that Jesus wants. Hell gone from earth. But we misunderstood our role. And we made this about waiting can't wait for heaven. Focus on heaven. But Jesus' focus was about bringing heaven to earth. That the good work starts now. The restoration starts now. Jesus focuses on bringing heaven to earth. That's why Paul says, hey, if I'm going to live in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I better get to work. And then he continues, yet what shall I choose? I I do not know. I am torn between the two because he knows. He's been there. Heaven is better. But God is using me now, so he's torn. I desire to depart to be with Christ. Now, did you know the phrase go to heaven isn't anywhere in the Bible? When it talks about death, it says that we are with Jesus, that we are with Christ. So Paul says, I desire to be with God, to dwell with God, to be with Jesus. Maybe that's when Paul was caught up to the third heaven, he saw what John recorded, that God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he was seated on the throne and said, I am making everything new. But right now, The option is not to wait. This isn't about waiting and hoping for someday in the future. Paul says, I'm torn between the two. I desire to be with Christ, which is better by far. So Paul says, whatever you can imagine, heaven is way better. But it is necessary for uh, for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. See, we focus on getting to heaven, but he's he's about bringing heaven to earth, getting the hell out of earth. That's why Paul writes this very next line. He commands the Jesus followers in Philippi, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. See, the world is not your home. You're a stranger. You're a foreigner. You're an exile. You're an alien. You're a sojourner. You're a pilgrim in this world. This world shouldn't feel right. And if you don't do anything else, above all else, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Do you do that? Do you conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ? I know at one time in my faith, I really thought this whole thing was about one day, just sit and be moral. I thought, hey, I just wait, and one day every God's going to set everything right. But I changed my belief. And what we believe about eternity determines how we live today. I'm telling you, these first followers of Jesus, they understood that. Like from the beginning, the people of God joined together. They were armed with the message of hope and healing. They joined Jesus in bringing heaven to earth, and they leveraged their lives to advance the message and the mission of Jesus. They, they believed that God had strategically placed them in this life. That if you're on the edges of Christianity and you are skeptical today of the church, I completely get it. That if you sat, thought this was all about just sitting and attending, just sitting and waiting, I have to tell you that there was once a version of faithfulness to God that caused people to lean in. 
There was once a version of Christianity that drew people to Jesus. There was once a version of Christianity that didn't just sit and wait. No, they sacrificed for one another. They loved one another. They served one another. They were devoted to one another. They honored one another. They accepted one another. They forgave one another. They were compassionate toward one another. They encouraged one another. They stood by one another. They did not betray one another. They did not lie for one another. They did not wait for heaven. They focused on bringing heaven to earth. And they did this by holding on to grace and truth at the very same time. There was once a version of Christianity where the Jesus followers lived for God and it was attractive to the people in their culture. They lived for Jesus in such a way that drew people to Jesus by the hundreds and by the thousands and by the millions. Jesus followers, that's our roots. That's how it started. Throughout history, there's always been a remnant of Jesus followers that have been the most progressive, sacrificial, compassionate, innovative, loving, generous people in the entire world. And throughout history, Jesus followers care for the sick became our hospitals. Jesus followers care for the widows became our soup kitchens. Jesus followers care for the orphans became our orphanages. They started clothes pantries and rescue missions and homes for unwed mothers. They, they believed in education for everyone, men and women, rich, poor. Jesus followers were at the forefront of the civil rights movement. They discovered vaccinations, American Red Cross, Salvation Army, YMCA, Compassion International, Samaritan's Purse. History proves that from the very beginning, Jesus followers created generational change. They shifted their focus from waiting to heaven and focused on bringing heaven to earth. And it was their sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus that changed them. The gift of God's grace messed with them. It motivated them. It empowered them. Their faith actually impacted their life. And they believed and lived as if God had strategically placed them in this moment. See, if you follow Jesus, I want to challenge you with this. That when we read our Bible, I believe we overemphasize the people that we read about in the Bible. I believe that God strategically placed them. But what if you actually believe that God strategically placed you? What if you believe Abraham had his time? Did great with his time. Moses had his time. Esther had her time. Ruth had her time. Paul, John, Mary, they had their time. And God has strategically placed them. But what if you actually believe that God strategically placed you? Let me ask it this way. If every Jesus follower alive today followed Jesus like you followed Jesus, what would the world think about Jesus' followers? This is our time. To bring heaven to earth. This is our time to, 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 this is our watch. And get this church, the church is dying on our watch. If every Jesus follower alive today followed Jesus like you followed Jesus, what would the world think about Jesus followers? Those first followers of Jesus didn't sit around and wait. They changed the world. They fought injustice. They righted wrongs. They stood up for those who couldn't stand up for themselves. They, they brought value to every beating heart. That is their story. God did that through them. But here you and I stand in this moment as American Christians. What will our story be? We're the best educated, best funded, best connected, best uh, fed followers of Jesus to ever live. What will our future Christians say about our faith in this moment? They sat around and waited. We're stewards of the faith of this generation. We set the tone and the pace for the next generation. What will our story be? See, as Jesus follows, what will the church be known for after us? What will our story be? They sat around and waited for heaven. I hate waiting. I hate waiting. But the message today is simply this, stop waiting for heaven. Because if you think heaven is about one day in the future, you're probably just going to hate heaven. Because that's what Jesus taught his followers to pray this prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on where? On earth. On earth. On earth. As it is in heaven. Our role. Your role. Is to bring heaven to earth. Now I know I've been saying you might hate heaven. I just want to be honest with you. You won't. You won't. Heaven's going to be better than anything you can ever imagine. John says it this way, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from the God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among 
the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Church, let's stop waiting. Stop waiting and start bringing heaven to earth. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much that you gave us a role that it's not about sitting back and waiting for one day, but you want to invite us in. So, Father, I pray that as we look at our life and examine our life where we see hell on earth, Father, I pray that you would help us to bring heaven to that in our lives, that you would give us the wisdom and knowledge to know how to do that, to bring hope to the hopeless. Father, I pray that we would live differently because we have been choosing heaven over earth. May we wake up this week choosing heaven over earth over earth. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're not going to hate heaven. You're really going to love it. That's the truth. Uh, But every conversion account in the book of Acts, someone who accepted what Jesus had done for them, did that so in the waters of baptism. So if you want to do that today, we'd love to have a conversation with you in the next steps room. It's out the door and to the left. If you want to uh, check this out online, text NEXT to 317-576-2288. Eight, eight, and make sure you come back next week. We've been studying and preparing for what we call hope in the dark. Do you know somebody who needs some hope? Come back for hope in the dark and have a great week. See you next week.